I want to uh, congratulate everybody for sticking with us. Uh, it's been a terrific day. We're almost at the end, but uh, believe me, we haven't. Uh, we're not going to trail off in terms of intensity. Um, so uh, this is uh, sort of the last presentational part, and we're going to have a wrap-up right after this. But um, So uh, welcome back uh, for those of you who are here and those of you who are online and on the phone. Uh, my name is David Fukuzawa. I'm a member of the Roundtable, uh, and I'm the Managing Director for Health at the Kresge Foundation. And uh, myself, along with Jennifer Fass Bender from GRF, uh, will be moderating this final session. Uh, and we have a couple of terrific speakers with us today. So, you know, we have focused largely today on uh, the social determinants, as 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 we should on, a, on issue on, equ uh, on is as issue as important as equity. Um, but we're going to end this um, presentational part by looking at um, the lessons that we've learned from obesity treatment in healthcare settings. And to help us kick this off. Uh, we're, we're going to be first hearing from uh, Dr. Melissa Simon, the George H. Gardner Professor of Clinical Gyne Gynecology at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. So with that, welcome, Dr. Simon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's also a real pleasure to be able to get two roundtables together at the National Academy of Medicine. I represent the roundtable on the promotion of health equity um, and also one of their in innovation collaboratives on care culture and uh, deliver uh, decision making. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I also have to say I'm a member of the United States Preventive Services Task Force, and so my views and presentation don't necessarily reflect theirs although I'm integrating some of it into here. Um, so we've heard a lot about design and design thinking and health equity by, by design is a really important um, concept. And if you think about it, if you go back to if you were ever in an architecture, basic architecture design class, um, the elements make a lot of sense and how we apply them you know, in terms of unity, harmony, balance, hierarchy, um, similarity, contrast, and that whole process of design of iterations and, and trying something and then doing it again and, and then rapid cycling it again to evaluate, that's important. And that trajectory of time is also important as you design things and modify things. Um, think about history and, and how um, health inequities really came about um, and how design impacts training thinking about health professions training, how we design primary care delivery, how we design the spaces of the primary care clinics themselves, how we connect it to community, and how we design the partnership between communities and people and um, primary care, how we design our laws and our health care delivery reimbursement and payers, all of those things, even our electronic health record, all that design impacts health equity, upstream, downstream, all over the stream. Uh, determinants of health are important. Um, and if we really want to take some, uh, a group of people to an outcome, like obesity prevention or reduction, um, in terms of equity, and if we parallel that to going to an apple orchard and we want everyone to pick an apple off the tree, um, we have to recognize that not everyone is going to be able to pick that apple in the same way. We also have to make sure that we understand that not everyone's going to want to pick an apple. They're going to want a pear or a banana or something else. And we're going to have to partner with them. And we have to also understand the design of that orchard's um, policies on who they let into the orchard and how the, the trees are cared for and what kind of pesticides are used, right? And, and how do you make those apples appealing or not? So all of those things and it really impact um, equity and it really starts with design. So in terms of primary care or anything in general, uh, we are often asked which social determinants do we really improve? What do we start with? And, and it's really hard to answer that question, right? Many of our policy prescriptions and programmatic interventions try to help people or families circumvent obstacles. And, and some of these programs do help get people over the wall, right, over to that barrier. Um, but some programs represent only temporary solutions. And you see that a lot when you look at the science of healthcare um, uh, uh, interventions in primary care settings to um, it, whether it's geriatrics, adults, 
uh, pediatrics, uh, obstetrics, you see the issues with short-term intervention, high bolus, high dose, high intensity, um, and then all of a sudden we don't know what happens afterwards. There's very little known on the follow-up, and there's also very little known on the merging of multiple interventions and how you can get them to work together to actually improve uh, longer-term obesity outcomes. So it's complicated, right? It's this complicated mess, and we know that we have to do everything. The question is how, and what forces, so we gotta think about history, what forces have driven up obesity, and why are the, what are, where are the opportunities in primary care settings for a response? Right, so there's many interacting factors. Again, going back to design thinking and systems thinking, right? There's forces outside of the community, right? Food supply, advertising, messaging, right? Um, there's transportation issues. Um, there's discrimination, bias, et cetera. Um, there's uh, healthcare capacity, what you have in, this, in terms of provider supply in a particular area. Are you rural, suburban, urban? Um, the cost of care, the system integration, provider location, et cetera. You have personal capacity, right? And you have local living conditions. Again, the social determinants of health really impact that, social capital within a particular neighborhood or area of a community. Um, and then you've got you know, individual things like metabolic stressors, nutrition, physical activity, stress, and then health behaviors and healthcare utilization. So again, going back to dynamics and syst systems dynamics thinking, you have multiple goals, right? Got to improve diet, increase physical activity, decrease physical inactivity, assure healthful conditions in diverse behavioral settings. So what's your condition like at work? Are you a shift worker? Are you a night worker? Um, is there opportunity for movement? Or are you sitting at a desk all day or all, all night? Um, what's school like? What's uh, the neighborhood uh, environment like? Is it too violent? Is it too much gun violence to go outside? What are some of the barriers on uh, all the different levels of individual community and policy, what's the cost of, of health protection efforts, what's the habits, um, all of these things impact this system in which we're trying to improve, right? Um, you also have simultaneous program strategies. How do you deliver healthcare services and messages that across multiple chronic conditions um, and impact multiple health behaviors as opposed to just focusing on diabetes or obesity or cardiovascular um, disease or oral health for that matter. Um, and you also have time delays, right? When you're trying to impact youth, youth are, they're invincible, right? <laughs> Adult life, that's a long time from now, right? They don't have to worry about what they eat. The Flaming Hot Cheetos or the Takis, like my kids like, you know, those are, those are great. <laughs> Right, um, and it also takes uh, even just for your metabolism one to two years for your metabolism to stabilize after change in net caloric intake. Right, and then you've got years for programs to be implemented. Research takes one to two decades to go from bench all the way to the community and back. Right, and if you think about that framework and you build that framework, the most important part of the slide is the top little dark green box with the arrow. And each of these elements changes over time. This is dynamic system, right? We have new policies that come into play all the time. We have new behaviors at the individual level. Who knows um, what happens at any given day or any given year. So all of these things change with time. So you have to think about that in terms of dynamic system. So the United States Preventive Services Task Force has some guidelines. Um, in terms of, they recommend as a B recommendation that clinicians screen for obesity in children and adolescents age six years or older um, and offer or refer them to comprehensive, intensive behavioral interventions to promote improvements in weight status. We also recommend that clinicians offer or refer adults with a BMI of 30 or greater to intensive multi-component behavioral interventions. Well, how much, if you look around the country, how much access is there to these types of interventions, especially for minority or underserved um, or isolated populations? 
we did look at the evidence and we conclude that there's a moderate certainty that screening for obesity in adults has a moderate net benefit. Um, and especially with respect to being able to refer to intensive interventions. And there's adequate evidence that these intensive interventions can lead to an average weight loss of four to seven kilos. Um, and those ultimately improve glucose tolerance and other physiologic risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, but we did find there was inadequate direct evidence about the effectiveness of these interventions on long-term health outcomes. Um, and then behavioral-based weight loss interventions with or without weight loss medications were associated with more weight loss and a lower risk of developing diabetes and control conditions. Um, and weight loss medications, but not behavior-based interventions, were associated with higher rates of harms. And longer-term weight and health out outcomes data, especially on minority populations, were limited. And here's the issue. There, we have studies, right, but in order to get to the level of being able to influence recommendations at a United States Preventive Services Task Force level, you need studies that have sound, uh, um, sound research designs, RCTs being randomized controlled trials being the gold standard, and big samples. And the issue also becomes then trying to find these studies of the quality that's required and the rigor that's required to get into our reviews is actually really hard when you're trying to find populations, um, studies that include populations that are minority, underserved, and underrepresented in research. And so the evidence doesn't necessarily follow and connect to um, recommendations that would be for all populations because of this lack of participation. We have to go back to history. Why don't people participate in research, right? And the mistrust and all of these other issues um, that compile. So again, going back to design, even research is impacted and can, can perpetuate inequity. So just a little um, primer here in terms of some of the other evidence from adults, uh, the adult um, obesity world and primary care. Patients overwhelmingly regain the weight if there's no long-term plan. Behavioral therapy and exercise are key to weight loss maintenance, and the high-intensity um, interventions are most effective, but we've also already identified earlier in presentations today that they're harder to access, they're harder to do, especially if you work at night or you're a shift worker or you have multiple shifts, um, and so that just becomes really hard for certain populations. Um, in terms of commercial programs, limited studies show that they can work, but they're also expensive, and they and they don't pr none are proven superior. And racial ethnic minorities tend to have less access to such programs. We have diet recommendations. Um, the issue about here is that medical school is terrible at training people in nutrition counseling. I mean, I'm going to out doctors because I'm one myself. Um, and and there are changing though um, think, uh, access to resources such as MyPlate, ChooseMyPlate.gov, that has access to 21 different languages, and you can modify things, and you can work with patients from more diverse populations and help support them in better ways. So things are changing and moving in the right direction, but not necessarily as fast as we need it to. Um, and there's still a lot of work to do, and training is also really important here. Um, prescribing exercise. So research shows that effective counseling can be done in about five minutes, but you have to know how to do that. And again, another thing that we didn't learn in medical school. Um, and um, appointments one to two times a month for at least 16 weeks are most effective in establishing baby behavioral changes. But think again, think about that schedule and think about access and think about how often you actually see, um, my, especially minority patients or patients from lower resource backgrounds and settings. Um, you know, I have a hard time. I, my patients are all from, uh, uh, all public aid or uninsured, um, and it's enormously hard to get them into prenatal care every one to two weeks. Um, now, we have Dr. Chin and his uh, colleague, Dr. Peek, at the University of Chicago, um, and they've done some really great work around improving diabetes care and outcomes on the south side of Chicago in terms of um, grocery store tours and um, food prescriptions and exercise or physical activity prescriptions. So really thinking outside of the box and taking some of those elements that have been talked about earlier, especially in the session preceding this one with community, and infusing them into primary care, 
Because it's not one or the other. It's got to be together, right? You've got to connect what's happening in the community and the environment of particular um, and lifestyle of a particular um, patient into that uh, primary care setting and vice versa. So there's the electronic health record, and that really has a lot of promise. And we see a lot of uh, research around tools, patient support tools, clinical care decision making, um, shared decision making tools. But death by tool and death by pop-up on the electronic health record when you have 50 to complete at the end of every full day clinic session is no joke, right? How many times can I figure out how to bypass, did you ask the patient, does she want a flu shot today? Uh, you know, you learn to bypass them and so you get fatigue um, as a clinical care provider trying to get through all of that electronic health record stuff. So how do you do it? How do you really design primary care and integrate the social determinants of health and other things that we have to address in the primary care visit now to try to really, really address a, a particular patient's needs to get her or him to the next step in their health trajectory, how do you do that in a way that's effective for that particular patient? And that's like the $50 million question if one of you wants to solve that. Let me know. Um, uh, again, we can go over the non-judgmental approach and, and the bias and stigma um, and, and trying to be as patient-centered and person-centered as possible, um, but it becomes hard. Right? We know that obesity is not fair. Other di diseases promote obesity and impede its treatment. Um, how much we sleep matters, right? It's really unfair for women, um, especially because of motherhood and pregnancy and menopause. Those are, those are more <laughs> opportunities and challenges, right? Um, obesity is not always reversible. Um, environment matters. Um, and payer and reimbursement models um, can incentivize. So I'll let Dr. Chin take over that part with his talk. Um, um, and healthcare providers have more impact when they are engaged in making healthy lifestyle choices, and they have to manage their implicit attitudes and obesity of others. So, if you look across adults, geriatrics, pediatrics, obstetrics, in every single population in this primary care delivery world, bias and discrimination really pretty much trump everything else. You can't get anything. Any, through that conversation or that communication with a, a patient in your exam room and their family or their um, caregivers or loved ones or whoever's in there with you, you can't get through to them if you haven't built trust. And they're coming, some of them will come with mistrust. They'll come with not understanding. They'll come with lower health literacy. They'll come with a lot. And it is our job as primary care providers to actually figure out how to control our own biases. First, acknowledge them, because they're pretty omnipresent. Um, omnipresent. Um, and, and minimize and reduce bias and stigma as much as possible. Um, we know from research that many healthcare providers have strong negative attitudes and stereotypes about people with obesity, and that's across every single age group, and pregnant or not pregnant. And we also know across every single age group, pregnant or non-pregnant, um, and there's varying levels of data, very little in geriatrics population um, that I could find uh, about how that then plays out to lower life satisfaction, lower quality of life, and increased depressive symptoms. But there are, there's evidence across every single age group and group that this plays out. Um, so, um, but we also get very little implicit bias or implicit attitudes training and testing uh, in terms of uh, healthcare professionals. Um, so increasing provider empathy uh, through perspective taking exercises have been uh, shown to improve or decrease bias. Um, alter perceived norms regarding negative attitudes and stereotypes about people with obesity. You know, the data really show that people tend to be more um, outward in terms of their implicit attitudes and bias for obese patients than from racial, ethnic, diverse patients. Um, the assessment of implicit attitudes from for, through tools such as the implicit association test, which you can do online um, for free. Uh, educating providers on uh, integrating strategies for providing a welcoming and a less threatening healthcare environment. We have to think about how we create the spaces in our clinics 
um, how we make sure the chairs are large enough so that there's not that stigma about, oh my gosh, I can't go to this healthcare provider, their chairs are too small, or there's no exam table that I can fit on, or there's no scale that's big enough for me, or I have to go to the zoo to get my MRI because I can't fit in the machine. Right. These things happen, and, and they perpetuate the stigma. And then people do not want to come to the provider because of these things, bias and, and stigma. They get afraid, and the cycle repeats itself, because then they don't enter care, or they, start, they stop participating in care, or they're not what we would call not adherent to treatment or noncompliant. Right? And so the cycle perpetuates. So we got to think about that. Right. Um, for pediatrics, again, there's four domains of effective primary care interventions. Um, really have focus on short-term effectiveness, and there's less data on long-term effectiveness. But they tend to be family-based programs, including parenting skills and parenting support. Motivational interviewing across age groups has proven to be um, effective in, in helping people set goals. Um, Office-based practice tools, so again, electronic health record prompts, reminders, provision of self-management support. Um, patient education, policy interventions. Um, Sugar-sweetened beverages, though, is a big deal um, across adult and, and pediatric and adolescent populations, but definitely around pediatric and adolescent populations. I'll just skip that. But again, bias and discrimination play out for pediatrics and adolescent. And neither shame nor stigma motivates people of any age or background to lose weight. Um, and the stigma contributes to behaviors for adolescents especially in terms of binge eating, social isolation, avoidance of healthcare services, decreased physical activity, and increased weight gain, and decreased quality of life. Um, and that just worsens obesity and creates additional barriers to healthy behavioral change. And that sets the tone for the rest of the life. You've lost them then. And trying to get them back is really hard. And training, 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 super important. Addressing weight stigma, and that's often attached to bullying in many different ways, especially how it plays out in social media these days. Obstetrics care, um, about 50% of all women in the United States exceed recommended uh, weight gain guidelines. Um, and our weight gain guidelines um, through the National Academy of Medicine, or was IOM back then, in 1990 didn't even have um, obese women of BMI greater than 29 in the table. It was in a footnote. This was 1990. 2009, which are the most recent NAM um, publication for this, uh, it did include obese uh, women uh, greater than or equal 30 BMI um, in the table, regardless of age and race, et cetera. And so what changed in 20 years? Well, we have a changing demography of our country, including maternal age. Now, national guidelines across the world differ. In some places, like the UK, they don't even weigh women routinely for perinatal care, um, and there's no goals. Um, Canada says about 15 pounds. Uh, United States says five to nine kilos. Um, but gestational weight gain is not a Healthy People 2020 goal. It's not in there. Um, so these are all really important for understanding the the landscape of uh, primary care and what we're supposed to do in obstetrics. Um, it is a teachable moment, though. Pregnancy is always considered uh, an ideal time to intervene, because that's when you've got mother and child, a captive audience, and it's a time in a woman's life that she is most engaged with primary care. Right? She has to go for the first few um, months of pregnancy, you go every month, but then you increase to every three weeks and every two weeks, and then every one week you're going to the provider. So about 13, 12 to 15 visits, and if you have gestational diabetes or diabetes or high blood pressure um, or gestational hypertension, you go even more frequently. So that is a whole lot of healthcare visits in a nine month period of time, right? So it is an opportunity. And it's also noticed, noted as a window to future health, not only for the mom, but for the baby. So if you have high blood pressure or high blood sugar in pregnancy, you have a higher chance of having hypertension or diabetes later on in life. And you can confer that to um, your progeny as well. Here's a, a study that showed um, this are uh, the red boxes, or this shows the risk of having an overweight or obese adult da daughter um, based on maternal pre-pregnancy BMI. So each of those um, gray bars, uh, gray sections of this graph, are pre-pregnancy -pre -pre BMI categories for mothers. And then those boxes, the red and, um, boxes, are the relative risk of having an overweight or obese adult daughter. 
in those mothers. So it increases as you go up. So several theories suggest that in utero nutrition may impact chronic disease, such as diabetes, hypertension, and other metabolic diseases to the offspring. So you are what your mom ate. The issue with research in this area, though, is that gestational weight gain is an exposure and an outcome. And so you've got to deal with um, the exposure to gestational weight gain um, and then the outcome of gestational weight gain and how it impacts things like cesarean birth um, and severe maternal morbidity and birth trauma and neonatal mortality and preeclampsia and diabetes. So it's all, all related, right? Preconception can work, but very few people, especially um, women of color, come to preconceptional counseling to try to lose weight before getting pregnant. Um, health behavior interventions for g gestational weight gain are mixed um, in their uh, outcomes. The, we have uh, several trials that have tried to impact gestational weight gain, but they've shown mixed data, mixed results. And long term, we don't know. Um, there are data coming out from the National um, Multi-Site uh, Life Moms uh, consortium, which had uh, seven uh, sites across the country doing different types of intensive lifestyle intervention. And um, with such high intensity, you can impact um, a gestational weight gain, but at, a, at an order of about 1.5 kilograms in the control group versus the very intensive DASH diet and uh, coaching and lifestyle modification for that nine month period of time. So we're, they're now looking at um, the cohort of children um, and then the moms later on, but those data won't come out for a while now, from now. So what we looked at on our team is does the type of prenatal care matter? because um, per perinatal care hasn't been really redefined in a long time or redesigned. Um, and so uh, centering pregnancy, which is group prenatal care versus our traditional in one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, one patient to one provider prenatal care, we tried to see if there was a difference in gestational weight gain, and we saw no difference by putting together a cohort for um, over, over a four-year period of time. Um, and so the trial, the we still don't know if we can modify the way we deliver perinatal care to impact not only gestational weight gain, but also maternal mortality. Um, and and that's a, we have a trial under review right now at NIH to really figure out is can we integrate social determinants of health into tra traditional prenatal care to try to really improve outcomes, um, especially for African American women. So we have all of this stuff, right? We can plot, uh, we can show people their uh, gestational weight gain over time, and, and that has been proven to work. But again, longer term outcomes, we don't know. We can do motivational interviewing, and we know that it will work, but we, we can't we don't know how that will hap, um, impact longer term. Uh, so again, discrimination is another big thing. Um, it really does take a village, and it is about modifying the architecture. But um, what's really important to understand is that health inequities do not just happen. And it the architecture and design of what we do, whether it's in policy and in reimbursement or in perinatal care or, pre or um, primary care delivery and in training, it all matters. And we have to really think about each of these systems together and how we can move forward with trying to eliminate obesity disparity. Thank you.